Ex-Muslims, arguably more than any other group, are deeply familiar with the problems entrenched within Muslim communities and inherent within Islamic scriptures. As most of us happen to be both people of color and first or second generation immigrants, we are doubly affected, both by hatred and violence from Muslims, but also bigotry and xenophobia from the broader American public. Despite all this, my experience over the last two years has made me wary of speaking up, even to an audience such as this. I always expected feeling unwelcome from Muslim audiences, but I didn't anticipate an equal amount of hostility from my allies on the left. For example, when I first published a piece, fact-checking Raza Aslan, who is a prominent Muslim scholar, on his dismissal of female genital mutilation as only an African problem, not a Muslim one, I got many responses from people unhappy with what I wrote, almost all of whom questioned my motives rather than addressing my claims. To my surprise, most of my critics were not Muslims. Rather, they identified as liberals and sometimes even atheists. Some darkly alluded to my agenda, and others claimed that as a former Muslim, there was no way I could be trusted with fair criticism. There is a curious double standard at play when Muslim clerics, clerics and activists that are known to be anti-Semites and homophobes are welcomed on campuses, touring nationally, invited to give lectures by Muslim student associations, while feminists like Asra Nomani, who has been fighting for equality of the sexes, for the right to female entry to the priestly class, is branded as a bigot by the same Muslim student organization. And the authorities at universities like Duke succumb to this brazen attempt to silence her. Similar patterns are repeated across the Western world. Maryam Namazi, who is an ex-Muslim activist, was disinvited to speak at Trinity, Ayan Hirsi Ali at Brandeis. The British Student Union now allies itself broadly with, the Islam with Islamist organizations such as CAGE. To quote Nick Cohen from his article from The Guardian, university managers are no better than their teenage heresy hunters. They say they want to oppose radical Islam in argument. The lawyers' secular society took them at their word. It tried to present an investigation at the University of West London into Islamist groups that were all over campuses, despite their record of advocating Jew hatred, homophobia, and misogyny. The university authorities banned the secularists. Let me be clear. I don't think anyone, even bigots emerging from Muslim communities or anywhere else, should be silenced. What I ask is that we stand up for the right to speak of all, including those, both those who stand with us and those who call for the death of our fellow disbelievers. Our society functions because we believe that hurt feelings mean essentially nothing in the eyes of our justice system. But of course, it is claimed that this is a special case because these aren't just personal hurt feelings, these are religious hurt feelings and not just any religion, but the religion of the underdog, of the brown man. And the left decided long ago that the hurt feelings of the Christian religion mattered, mattered little, and it was imperative that we disabuse the notion that Christianity would ever feel safe from criticism or even outright mockery. Indeed, many of our greatest thinkers have delighted in exercising this right. I want to quote Thomas Paine from his, public, his uh, book, The Age of Reason. Whenever we read the obscene stories, the voluptuous debaucheries, the cruel and torturous executions, the unrelenting vindictive vindictiveness with which more than half the Bible is filled, it would be more consistent that we call it the word of a demon than the word of God. It is a history of wickedness that has served to corrupt and brutalize mankind, and for my part, I sincerely detest it, as I detest everything that is cruel. I wonder if Paine had been murdered for his outright contempt of Christianity, how different would the West look today? What message such a gruesome deed would have sent, how many people would it have silenced with its promise of more bloodshed to come if they had the audacity to repeat his crime? Would that fear have silenced those who, who insisted on the freedom of speech? How would that have affected the face of our nation? Now, I hope you reflect on me, that the, on the fact that not only was he not murdered, neither was his contemporaries who, were, who mocked religion. Also, even then, three centuries ago, I don't believe he contemplated the idea that writing would actually lead to his death. 
And yet, in the 21st century, this is the reality of those who speak out against Islam in Muslim countries, and increasingly in Western ones. It's not uncommon to hear from commentators in various media outlets that the victims of Charlie Hebdo had somehow provoked others with their offensive cartoons into taking their lives. The sentiment seemed to be that the cartoonists must to some, agree, to some degree be held accountable for their own murders, even as dozens of cartoonists from the East drew panels in support of their counterparts in the West, risking their own lives for freedom of speech. There are people who use the phrase Islamophobia, both to mean criticism of the people and of the religion. I know that many Muslims do this. It's an easy way of stopping others from criticizing their religion. Uh, but I believe that many in the West use this word because they haven't quite thought of why it might be harmful. Islamophobia is a meaningless term. It serves to confuse and to muddle two very different forms of intolerance based on two very different reasons towards which there should be two very different reactions. Sometimes it is claimed that the critique of religion is critique of the identity of the believer and is therefore bigotry. This person's identity happens to be based around their ideo ideology, so if you criticize their ideology, you are necessarily generating hate towards that person. But I wonder what would happen if we applied this type of thinking to everything? What if New Agers decided that criticism of New Age spiritual healing was a form of hate against people who chose to identify that way? What if Hindus decided criticism of the caste system was a deeply offensive form of racism against Hindu people? How much of that would retard reform? There's another version of this argument which claims that criticism or ridicule of Islam feeds into the bigotry by the far right and therefore causes harm. And I want everyone to know that the argument is almost never that Islam doesn't deserve the critique or ridicule as a religion, but that it is harmful to, the, to voice it for the damage that it would do. Still, there are others who believe that those in the West that people in the West have no right to speak about problems of brown cultures due to the legacy of colonialism and other forms of violence the West has cast upon the East. This is a strange argument because it ignores the history of the world, a history in which various nations, Muslims and non-Muslims, have succumbed to the ebb and flow of conquest repeatedly for all of recorded history. Many Islamic countries, in fact, had horrific laws before colonialism. Two of the epicenters of Islamic thought, Iran for Shia Islam and Saudi Arabia for Sunni Islam, resisted colonialism. Excuse me. Um, in fact, Saudi Arabia was founded in 1744 as an extremist state, the first iteration of which was destroyed by the Ottomans due to their religious fanaticism. The first Saudis, in fact, attacked and desecrated some of the most holy Muslim sites and were stopped not by intervention of the West, but by other Muslims that viewed them as dangerous fanatics. There was then no American imperialism, no frame of wars against other Muslims, and yet fundamentalist Wahhabis existed and were attacking other Muslims very much the same way of that ISIS attacks them today. Reform is, poss is impossible when you constantly shift the conversation away from Islamic fundamentalism and back to Western violence and imperialism. But I don't, don't get me wrong, it's important to discuss this. It's important to discuss imperialism and the harm it caused. But violence in the name of Islam has terrorized the Middle East ever since its inception. And it's important that we don't derail this conversation. The moral paralysis out of fear of the right, out of fear of furthering bigotry, out of shame of prior crimes committed by other white people, should not trump all considerations. When I read articles of why Muslims shouldn't be ridiculed, I get a sense of condescension, a sense that there are those who believe that the most central trait of brown people is their religion, a defining feature, in fact. And due to this, they presume either that we won't reform or we can't, that religion is something inherent to who we are and that it won't respond to pressure to change the way Christianity responded to pressure by secularists. While they believe themselves to be supporting tolerance, what they're actually supporting is the religious right of the East. And not just any religious right, not the religious right we have here. It's a religious right the West hasn't seen for centuries. To me, to someone who, someone who opposes the most foundational liberal principle, the freedom of expression, in order to protect the sensibilities of this Islamist religious right, is a liberal only in name. In fact, 
What kind of person holds two different groups of people accountable to two different standards of acceptable behavior, but a bigot? Obviously, Islam isn't the root of all evil, but it's an important factor. What we have here is a right wing in the West who believes that Islam personifies evil and a left which refuses to even look into it as a source of harm. The question then becomes, how do we achieve reform without actually mentioning any problems in Islam? How do we achieve progress while shying away from one of the foundational aspects of how harmful practices are justified? Most cultures are responsive to selective pressure, and by insisting that no pressures be applied, we are acting as a break on any progress. We have plenty of evidence that a push for secularism or a presence within secular cultures can change behavior and even the beliefs of Muslims. For example, if you compare Muslims living in the US with Muslims in the Middle East, you will find across all metrics that their opinions are less extreme and more in line with liberal values than of those of the population of their origin countries. Many Muslims believe that their religion is immutable, that every word of which is true, and reformers ins insult them when they demand change. Yet profound changes in the way Muslims practice their religion have occurred in the past. Many Muslim countries practice slavery up until the 20th century, what, with some countries abolishing slavery as recently as 1981, citing religious sanction of the practice as a justification. Saudi Arabia's slave population was estimated as 300,000, a scant 50, 50 years ago, and it was international pressure that forced abolition. Under pressure from the British Empire to abolish slavery a little over a century ago, the Sultan of Morocco cited the inerrancy of the Quran to make the case for the divine sanction of slavery. Later, the chief minister of Morocco, Mohamed Idris, wrote in response to anti-slavery efforts that we do not interfere in religious principles which you profess. Likewise, you should not interfere in our religion. In the face of Ottoman unwillingness to condemn the status of slaves as enshrined, to, as, as enshrined in Sharia, a British statement sarcastically stated that one might well ask the Sultan to become a Christian. Yet today, most if not all Muslims are repulsed by the idea of slaves. Did they abandon the Quran, which seemed to clearly condone slavery a mere century ago, or were we able to shift mainstream consensus by standing up for our moral principles? I wonder what it would have happened if the benevolent bigots of the West, of the left today, who feel that it is more important to respect a culture for the sake of respecting a culture, had existed back then. How many millions would be living in chains today? We must remember that there is no inevitable march of progress, no guarantee that tomorrow's world will be more just, more equal, more rational, more tolerant, or more tolerant or reasonable. Liberal rights without liberals to champion them are values without influence, with no defense. Let's not let our empathy for oppression of one group excuse their oppression of another. Thank you.